told the man. Eke homo, behold the man. I am going to do my best within the limited time I have this afternoon to try to answer this question for you. What does it mean to be human when we say eke homo? And of course, we are using it in the sense generically of men and women because of the humankind in which we both represent here. What does it mean to be human? The Christian is the only one who deals with this with the laws of logic and the conformity to truth in answering it. What do I mean by that? Truth has two theories, correspondence and coherence. Every statement, if it is true, will correspond to reality as it is. And all of the statements put together in your answers must have coherence. They must cohere together. When you go to a court of law, the lawyer questioning you will look for these two areas. Do your answers conform to reality? Do all of your answers cohere together? May I suggest to you, the Judeo-Christian worldview is the only one that will give you answers that correspond to reality and coherently answer this question. What does it mean to be human? There are four basic categories that I wish to bring to you. Number one is the category of creation. We are not here by accident. We are here by divine purpose and divine pattern. We are here because of divine purpose and divine pattern. There's a very well-known scientist in Cambridge who's now retired, John Pokinghorn, one of the leading quantum physicists of his time. In his book, One World, he taught, I had the privilege of taking a couple of lectures from him many, many years ago, talking about the whole notion of the universe and its coming into being. And his book, One World, is actually a summary of those lectures that he gives. But here it is. He makes this comment. He said, do you know how exact this universe had to be in its fine tuning in order to bring about the reality of humankind? The exactitude demanded, he said, is something like this. It's like taking aim at a one square inch object at the other end of the known universe, 20 billion light years away and hitting it bullseye. The margin of error was so small, he says it would be like taking aim at a one square inch object at the other end of the known universe, 20 billion light years away. Such exactitude. Dr. Chandra Vikramasinghe, professor from Cardiff in Wales of Sri Lankan origin, made the comment that the enzymatic makeup in your body and mind, just the enzymes, the possibility of those enzymes in bringing together what we have life is so remote, he said, it's like one in 10 to the 40,000th power. And his colleague, Frederick Hoyle said, the chances of that are as slim as a tornado going through a junkyard and producing a jumbo 747 as a result. Fine tuning inside your body and in this very universe itself. This is the exactitude of what the created order is all about. 3.1 billion bits of information in your human DNA. 3.1 billion bits of information. Can you imagine a dictionary developing because of an explosion in a printing press? That is what you call specified complexity. The created order. What does that mean? It means two things that I want to deduce from that. When you talk about creation, it means you have intrinsic worth. You have essential worth, not given by state, not given by government, but the essential value you have, and there is a reflective splendor. I want you to listen very carefully to this juxtaposing of two thoughts now. And it is this. When you think of what it is that Jesus said about what it means to be human. You realize 
the exactitude was so extraordinary because a man comes to him and says to him, is it all right to pay taxes to Caesar? And what did Jesus say? Do you have a coin? The man said, yes. He said, give me the coin. He picked up the coin and looked at the man and said, give to Caesar that which belongs to Caesar, but give to God that which belongs to God. The man should have had a second question. That question was, what belongs to God? He looked at the coin, whose image? Caesar. Give to Caesar that which belongs to Caesar. Give to God that which belongs to God. The man should have said, what belongs to God? Jesus would have said, whose image is on you? That's the extraordinary reality that God gives value to you and to me. But I also want to remind you, while Moses gave 611 or 613 laws, Jesus reduced them to two, to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. Because of the first, the second necessarily follows. Without the first, the second is with its feet firmly planted in midair. You love your neighbor as yourself because of the vertical dimension of loving God. But here's what I want to point out to you that's very critical. You are not lost in a sea of humanity. Your value is both general and particular. You have a particular value that is distinctively you.